Hello, and thank you for joining us for this session, Clinical Trials, What You Need to Know. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Clovis Oncology, for making this session possible. Now, clinical trials are a critical way to advance the science of ovarian cancer research, but they can also be intimidating. In this session, Dr. Stephanie Gallard will demystify clinical trials so you can figure out if a clinical trial might be right for you. Dr. Gallard is Director of Gynecologic Cancer Trials and Co-Director of the Developmental Therapeutics and Phase I Clinical Trials Program at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. You can view her full bio on the conference website. So thank you for being here, Dr. Gallard, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gayard, Director of Gynecologic Cancer Trials at the Johns Hopkins Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. Thank you for joining me today as I talk about clinical trials, what every patient and their caregivers should know. My disclaimer is that none of this information is meant to supplant the recommendation of your physician. Um, it's intended to be informative and, and help you understand whether or not a clinical trial may be something that you want to consider. The other thing to note is that uh, I work in clinical trials, so naturally I am um, pro-clinical trials and uh, would encourage you to consider a clinical trial. So there are often a lot of questions uh, about clinical trials that patients will come to me with. What is a clinical trial? Why would they do one? How do they find one? Where should they go, et cetera? And so these are some of the questions that I'd like to try to address for you today. So first, what is a clinical trial? Well, this is the definition from the cancer.gov website. Clinical trials are research studies that involve people, and through clinical trials, doctors find new ways to improve treatments and the quality of life for people with the disease. There, is a lot, there are lots of different types of clinical trials. The ones that I'm gonna be focusing on today are those that are used to treat cancer, but you should be aware that there are other types focused on uh, improving how we find and diagnose cancer, trials on learning better approaches to preventing cancer, and certain trials that are focused on the management of symptoms of cancer and the side effects from its treatment. The goals of therapeutic trials, these are trials that are meant to treat the cancer. The overarching mission that we have is to develop successful cancer treatments that allow people diagnosed with cancer to live longer, better lives. Clinical trials can help to determine whether new treatments are safe and effective. And this is particularly important for us to understand what differences there may be between different populations that may be races or ethnicities, but also whether these treatments are safe and effective for patients that have particular medical conditions. We wanna know whether the new treatments being developed work better than current treatments. And finally, whether they improve the quality of life for patients during and after treatment. Clinical trials are the key to making progress against cancer. All of the advances that we've made in the last several decades against cancer, people are living longer and doing better than they used to when diagnosed with cancer. All of those are related to clinical trials. Unfortunately, only about 5% of women with a gynecologic cancer participate in clinical trials. And I would say that this slows our progress against gynecologic cancers. So here's some information on the drug development timeline, how we move drugs forward for the treatment of cancer. Initially, studies occur in the preclinical area. This would be the laboratory setting. This can take several years. Here it says three to six years, but it can take uh, sometimes a couple of decades before things move forward. We are learning about particular drugs and their mechanism of action, how they are absorbed, what kind of side effects uh, and toxicities are identified in animals. Then once it looks like these particular drugs are promising, they would move forward into humans. There we start with a phase one trial. The goal of a phase one trial is to figure out what is the right dose to use of the drug. 
what are the side effects of the drug and what's the pharmacological profile in people. Once we've identified a safe uh, dose, we can move forward into a phase two study. There, we're more specifically looking at efficacy. This is usually a smaller trial, larger than in phase one, and is focused specifically on a particular uh, disease. So in phase one, patients may have all different types of cancers. And in phase two, now we may hone in specifically on uh, a particular cancer, patients that have a particular cancer. In phase three, we are now confirming safety and efficacy. And in particular, phase three studies are usually comparing the new treatment with the standard of care to determine whether the new treatment uh, is better than the standard. And then finally, there are studies that occur after approval um, in the United States by the FDA. And these would be post-marketing studies or phase four studies. These allow us to learn more about the safety profile, learn about efficacy, especially in particular po uh, populations, or determine the optimal use of these drugs. So why might someone participate in a clinical trial? There are lots of different reasons, but I would say one of the main ones is that standard therapy may have limited efficacy uh, in particular situations, or that a patient has had progression of their disease after standard therapies, and they're looking for new options. And implicit in that is the hope that the new treatment will be more efficacious than the standard of care. However, it's important to recognize that in a clinical trial, we don't yet have that answer. And so we can't say that it is more efficacious, but that that is, is the hope that we will learn that through the trial. The other reason a, a patient may participate is that access to the drug, new drug is not available as part of standard of care. That patients um, may receive improved care while on a clinical trial. We know that through closer monitoring and more frequent access to nurses and physicians, um, patients often report uh, that they uh, have a better quality of life or that um, they may do better overall while on a clinical trial. And then there are of course, philanthropic reasons. So they wanna give back, they wanna help others who may be diagnosed with their condition and they want physicians to learn from what they're experiencing. So why not participate in a clinical trial? Um, certainly if there's no trial available when you need it, I would not advocate delaying therapy to go on to a clinical trial. There are certainly some situations where waiting a week or two to research whether a clinical trial is an option would be reasonable, but there are other situations where it's important to initiate treatment as soon as possible. This is a discussion that you should have with your physician. Another reason why not to participate in a clinical trial is if the standard of care is expected to be better than the drugs offered on study. For our gynecologic cancers, we often have very good treatments available at initial diagnosis. And so I wouldn't advocate for doing something where we have no information about its efficacy over what's considered standard. Finally, it may not fit your lifestyle or it may impact quality of life. If there's not a trial that is available locally, um, or if you're going to have to spend more time than you really want participating in the trial, and it just doesn't fit how you see yourself um, and your treatment, then we wouldn't advocate for doing a clinical trial in that setting. When should you do a clinical trial? Well, common perception, and I would say a myth, is that you should do it when there's no other options available or no further standard of care options. However, my opinion is that it's appropriate to consider a clinical trial whenever the standard of care therapy falls short of the goal of curing or treating the disease without substantially affecting your quality of life. And so there are some gynecologic malignancies in some settings where we know that our current treatments 
are very good at curing the disease. And so in those settings, I wouldn't advocate for a clinical trial, again, of something experimental where we don't know the efficacy. These sorts of situations, it's important to talk to your physician to determine whether it's appropriate to consider a clinical trial. Here's sort of an example of the treatment course for ovarian cancer. There are lots of opportunities for clinical trials. There are certainly clinical trials looking at prevention strategies, some at diagnostic strategies, other at surgical strategies, and then treatments for chemotherapy and maintenance after initial diagnosis. And then for those who have had progression after initial treatment, either in second line or third line and beyond. What's most important is that you make sure that the treatment population of the trial, the patients that they're looking for, matches where you are in your treatment. And so if there's a study that is looking for patients who have had recurrent ovarian cancer, it wouldn't be appropriate to participate in that study if you're newly diagnosed. Where? Well, that really depends. Certainly there are some community oncologists who have access um, to clinical trials. Um, those may have more limited access and larger and be limited more to larger phase three trials. Private oncologists may have the most restricted access to clinical trials. There's been a push to try to allow community oncologists greater access to clinical trials. And this is through the National Cancer Institute NCORE program, which is the Community Oncology Research Program. And listed here is the website where you can find a local site that may have clinical trials for you. There are also clinical trials at large academic medical centers or NCI designated cancer centers or directly at the NIH NCI. There, there would be a, a wider variety of trials and they tend to have an emphasis on early phase clinical trials. I think what's most important to take away is that you want to go to a site that will have the infrastructure to conduct clinical trials. How? So how do you find these sites? Well, talk with your doctor. That's really the first step in figuring out whether a clinical trial is right for you, what local sites um, you may have access to. You can seek out a second opinion at a center performing clinical trials. And even if a, a clinical trial isn't appropriate at that initial time, following up periodically with them as you need to make new treatment decisions may afford opportunities to participate in a clinical trial. You can go to the NCI Find NCI Supported Clinical Trials website, which I've listed here. And then there are also clinical trials matching services. And I've given one example here, not to specifically endorse that one, um, but there are a number of, of, um, of different matching services available. So which clinical trials? It depends on the available studies as well as where you are in your treatment course. But when deciding, you may wanna take some of the following factors into consideration. What is the phase of the study? Drugs that are in later phase of development have a longer track record. We have more information both about their safety as well as their efficacy. So that may be a preferred study. What drugs are included in the study and what potential side effects those may have. Specific disease uh, factors that you have. So genetic factors or particular markers that are present in your tumor may help select a particular trial. And then some of the logistics. Some clinical trials are done in the outpatient setting. Some of them you need to be hospitalized. Some of them may occur at sites that are far away from you. And those logistics are really important as well. But this should really be a decision between you and your treating physician, and you can talk through some of these various options with them. So we've been um, talking a lot about precision medicine. We all would like to hone in on specific therapies that may be most beneficial for individual patients. 
And so here I just sort of have a, a schematic of some of the mutations, the alterations, changes that can happen within a particular um, person's tumor. When the cancer cell first develops, there may be some small alterations and then naturally over time, a few more may develop and one of them becomes a driver alteration, one that really is uh, driving the growth of the cancer. And as that cancer gets uh, larger and there are more cells, they may um, develop more and more alterations. And these are alterations that we can now get a report on. We can have the tumors analyzed. And here's an example of one uh, type of report, a readout that you may receive. But there's a lot of challenges with this. Um, we don't know within a specific tumor, which are the driver alterations and which are the passenger alterations. And then there are some that, other markers that may also predict response. And we are still learning more and more about those every day. Here are some examples of some known markers for gynecologic cancers, for ovarian cancer, the BRCA gene and homologous recombination are helpful in um, identifying specific therapies for endometrial cancer, mismatch repair and microsatellite status and cervical cancer, we use, anti, uh, we use PD-1 as a marker as well. But there had been a hope that there would be sort of one Achilles heel. And if we could identify that one thing that a cancer was susceptible to, that we could really eradicate cancer. And unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. There are very, very few cancers that have just that one thing that we can target. Um, and so we're learning more and more how to put um, this information together and target multiple targets within a cancer to try to treat it. So I wanna go through a number of different questions that I frequently get about clinical trials. And one that patients will often ask is, will I receive a placebo? And an important thing to recognize is that if you have a cancer, Anyone who is treating you wants to help you treat your cancer. And so you will not receive a placebo alone if you have an active cancer. So for example, what I have here on the right is a study that has two arms. One arm, the patient will receive chemotherapy plus a placebo. And in the other arm, they'll get chemotherapy with the study drug. And what I want you to recognize is that everyone is getting at least some treatment for their cancer, the standard of care chemotherapy. And the question that's being addressed is whether the study drug enhances the efficacy of the chemotherapy. What does it mean to be randomized? So here's a, a different style of study where um, there are two drugs, study drug A and study drug B. And here you may be randomized um, to either A or B. You don't get a choice. The physician doesn't get a choice. The study team doesn't get a choice. Uh, it's usually computer-based and an algorithm that determines which group you'll be uh, assigned to. And this is similar to that initial placebo controlled study that I mentioned. There too, you would be randomized and don't get a choice as to whether you get the study drug or the placebo with the chemotherapy. And then what is blinding? This is a procedure in which one or more parties in the trial are kept unaware of which treatment participants are assigned to. And all of these approaches are really designed to reduce bias so that the physician or the patient or a member of the study team isn't for some reason saying, I want you to put you, I want to put you on this particular arm of the study, or I want to give you this particular treatment. And instead, these approaches are used to make sure that we treat everybody in the study in the same way and reduce bias. How long will I be in the trial? Well, that really depends on the, the study and where you are in your treatment course. For some 
situations, it's appropriate after a period of time to complete treatment and then stop and monitor the efficacy. In other situations, for example, a recurrent uh, cancer situation, we will frequently continue treatment for as long as it's benefiting the patient. And that means as long as it's keeping the cancer under control, as long as the patient is not having any serious or unmanageable side effects. Why are the eligibility criteria so rigid? So there, for every study, they have a listing of eligibility criteria. This is because they want to select patients who are most appropriate for the study, but also recognizing that we don't yet have a lot of information of these drugs. We don't wanna treat patients who may be at higher risk for developing problematic side effects. And so it's important for researchers and participants to recognize that the eligibility criteria are very important and for patients to be able to enroll, they need to meet those eligibility criteria. And then who pays for the study? Will the patient have to pay to participate in the study? Does insurance participate? And most insurances will allow patients to participate in some types of clinical trials. This is something that we actually review with the patient's insurance before enrollment on the clinical trial. And what I tell my patients is that most insurance will allow uh, participation and that they will usually cover the standard of care costs. So for example, as someone is undergoing treatment for cancer, it's um, routine to do certain laboratory work to have physician visits, to have uh, perhaps infusion costs. And those costs for the study can still be billed to the insurance. On the other hand, there may be specific um, factors that are performed just for the clinical trial. Perhaps a biopsy is performed on the clinical trial and wouldn't otherwise be performed. That part would be paid for by the clinical trial. And in terms of the individual participation, uh, participants' costs, the patient would still need to cover whatever copay um, the insurance has for the standard of care costs. And then finally, what are the risks? And these are both risks due to the drug, potential side effects of the drug, um, risks that, may, that you may encounter because of procedures that you have to undergo while on the clinical trial. And then on the flip side is also um, asking about benefits. How much information do we know about how likely this is to help you? So again, I'd wanna emphasize that clinical trials are the key to making progress against cancer and everything we've learned is due to clinical trials. And I would have you consider enrolling in a clinical trial to help speed progress. I would love to see more than 5% of our patients enroll on trials because then we could advance the science and learn more about these new treatments in a on a faster basis. Here are some additional resources. There's wonderful information at the Foundation for Women's Cancer website. They have a whole PDF guide on clinical trials. You can see the front cover uh, here on the right. The American Cancer Society website has wonderful information, as does the National Cancer Institute website. Thank you for listening.